Hello everyone. So I want to talk about the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect is the change in the pitch of a sound due to either the source moving, you moving, or both you and a source of sound moving. The first thing to think about is what happens just with a stationary source. So I'm going to have some stationary source. And when this emits sound, it emits sound in wave fronts, right? So there are these wave fronts that come out and they have a wavelength lambda and they move at some velocity v, right? All of these wave fronts are moving away from this source at some velocity v. So what happens? Uh, after a little bit, this wave front gets to me and I hear it. And after a little while, this wave front gets to me and I hear it. And the wavelength or the rate at which these peaks hit me gives me the frequency of sound I hear. So the thing to notice is no matter where I'm at here, the wave fronts are going to hit me at the same rate, right? Because the wavelength is the same no matter what. And the rate that these waves are traveling out is the same. So the rate that the peaks hit me must be the same no matter what, right? And remember, frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength. And, it, and that's the same because the wavelength is the same everywhere and the velocity is the same everywhere. So this is what happens with a stationary source. Now let's think of what happens if we have a moving source. So with a moving source, everything gets shifted a little, right? And we see this in the simulation. So if you haven't seen this, go and check out the simulation. I'm just going to draw the situation first, and then I'm going to explain it. So this is moving at some V. The wave fronts are still moving at some V wave, right? This is V source. Um, and so why are they off center like this? So let's think about this for a second. If this source is moving, then there was some time when it was back here, right? And when it was back here, it emitted a wave that traveled out and became eventually in time, by the time that it moved over here, it became this big, this big wave we see. There's another one right here that was responsible for creating this wave front, right? But you know, after some time, by the time it gets out to this, this radius, it's moved over to this side, right? So what we're seeing are the wave fronts that are created by this source when it was back in time, okay? So this is an important thing to, to recognize. And what happens because of this? Well, we see that the wavelength is no longer the same in front and behind this object. It's actually no longer the same anywhere, right? So it means that if I'm an observer here, the waves that hit me, right, take a longer time to get to me. Like the peaks, the time between peaks is longer. And so it must mean that the frequency of the sound is different. If I'm over here, the waves that are hitting me have a much shorter wavelength, right? And because it's a shorter wavelength, the peaks hitting me more frequently means that the frequency I perceive is higher. So let's try to get this in terms of an equation, right? So I know that the wavelength prime is related to the original wavelength in some way. Well, how much is this wavelength shortened by here from its original amount? Well, it's shortened by the amount that this object has moved in the time in between it releases these pulses, right? So it releases one pulse, and then it moves a bit, and it releases another. And that distance that it's moved is how much the original wavelength is shrunk by. So the original wavelength is shrunk by the distance that this thing has moved in the time between pulses. And what is the time between pulses? Well, that's the period. So it's the velocity of the source times the period. So this is the critical realization here for this, for this problem, is that there's in between the creation of this big circle and this little one, the source moved some amount. And how much did it move? It moved Vs 
times the period, right? The time between pulses that get released. That's what the period is. Okay, and we can write this, rewrite this in terms of, all in terms of the wavelength. So what do we remember that uh, t is equal to? Well, we know that the velocity is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, and the frequency is one over the period. So we can relate this period to the original wavelength divided by the velocity of the wave, right? And so it's important we have two different things here. We have the velocity of the source and the velocity of the wave. Okay. And we get a nice little formula for our scrunched up wavelength. And it depends nicely on the ratio of the velocity of the source and the velocity of the wave. So this is what happens if we're here, if we're shrunk by this amount. But we can also be an observer here where the wavelength is lengthened by some amount, right? And what's the amount it's lengthened by? Well, just like this one was shortened by uh, this velocity times time, this one's gonna be increased. And so what we could do is just do the whole thing over again, but with plus signs. Uh, I'm just gonna write that as having a one plus or minus, and plus or minus, or minus plus, the wavelength of the speed. So the negative sign is source towards observer. The positive sign is source away from observer. Okay, and there's one last step to this. The one last step is we want to use this wavelength to calculate an actual frequency. So my shifted frequency I hear as an observer is just the wave speed, right? The velocity of that wave divided by the new wavelength I hear. Well, what's that equal to? That's equal to the velocity of the wave divided by lambda one minus plus Vs over Vw. Well, what's Vw over lambda? Well, that's just our original frequency. That's the frequency we were here if there were no strange things happening uh, with the source moving. But then we have this correction. Okay, so if we, if we just, I'm just gonna erase this because it's sort of white noise. And I move this over. And this is our super important formula. And there's one way to think about this. Um, a lot of people get confused with the negative signs and the positive signs. Well, if you're here, where this observer is, you're supposed to hear a higher frequency because the wavelengths are shorter together. So the trick to do it is to pick the sign that gives you the higher frequency. And what gives you the higher frequency? Well, it's the negative sign because this is, this is one and Vs over Vw is always a number that is, is smaller than one. Right, because the, if you go higher than VW, you're going faster than the speed of sound and some of this stuff sort of breaks down. But how do I make F bigger, a higher frequency? Well, you take one and you subtract a number from it to get a number that's smaller than one. So a number divided by a number smaller than one is a bigger number, right? If you want a lower frequency, if you're back here, you want to take your frequency and divide it by a number that's bigger than one. So you use the positive sign. Right, so you can remember stuff like this, but I think it's easier to figure out what the sign is just by reasoning through the physics. You know if you're on this side, it should be a higher frequency, you should get a higher number. And you know if you're on this side, you should get a lower frequency, a lower number.